due process. Winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2014 New York Emmys for our coverage of criminal justice and current affairs. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. The fact that it's that hard that we're even discussing this is, I think, a, a measure of how, unfortunately, uh, the, the venom and rancor in, in Washington has, has prevented us from getting basic work done. The unexpected death of a justice, a president's attempt to seat a replacement, a Republican Senate blocking the way. That's what dominates the public conversation. But the work of the now eight-member court continues in a session full of critical cases, ranging from voting rights to abortion, Obamacare to speedy trial. Our annual Supreme Court update up next on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding from the New Jersey State Bar Foundation and the PSEG Foundation, making things better in our communities. seat, now an eight-member court. And despite the president's push to fill the chair long held by Antonin Scalia, it seems likely the number will remain at eight for the rest of this term and into the next. So there's new attention on a philosophically divided court, where eight has already tended, no surprise, to split 4-4, but still at stake. Critical questions of abortion and affirmative action, immigration and Obamacare. And as always, when we want the inside story of what the justices are doing and what it means, we turn to court expert, court player, Steve Shapiro, National Legal Director of the ACLU. Steve, thanks for getting on the train and coming to us once again. It is our annual mm -hmm. Supreme Court scrutiny. But is it fair to say this is no ordinary year? Uh, well, you know, every year is interesting. This year is unexpectedly interesting. Uh, nobody anticipated we would be sitting here with an eight-member court. Obviously, Justice Scalia's death was a, was a surprise to everyone, but it has completely changed the dynamics of the year, and depending upon what happens in the confirmation process, could change the dynamics of the court for years to come. So everyone who pays attention to these things knows there's this struggle going on between the President and the Republican Senate. What most people may not understand is what happens when there's a 4-4 split. What happens when there is a 4-4 split, and, and I will say I think the court will do everything it can to minimize the number of 4-4 splits, which is to say in some of these controversial cases you may wind up getting very narrow decisions or decisions on procedure as mm -hmm. opposed to substance as a way of just issuing some decision. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they are hopelessly deadlocked, you get a one-sentence order from the court and the one sentence says the judgment below is affirmed by an equally divided court. There is no opinion. There, is, there are no dissents. Uh, the status quo stands. Whoever won below uh, holds on to their victory. So we had one big case mm -hmm. like that uh, having to do with workers' rights. What happened? Uh, it was a very important case. It was a case that had organized labor extremely worried. And the issue in a nutshell was this. In many states, um, if you are a public employee and there is a public employee union, um, even if you choose not to join the union, you have to pay what came to be known as a fair share fee, which is a percentage of the union dues that were used to negotiate and implement the collective bargaining agreement because the theory is the union has to negotiate on behalf of all employees, even those who do not join the union, and therefore all employees benefit from the collective bargaining agreement and they all ought to contribute to the cost of the collective bargaining agreement. And they will 
because of this 4-4 split, but if, it, if Scalia had still been on the court? If Scalia had still been on the court, I think the court would likely have ruled that compelling dissenting employees to pay for the union, um, or at least the negotiation of the collective bargaining agreement, was a violation of their First Amendment rights. This was a case that was on the conservatives' hit list for a while. They have been teeing it up uh, for several years, and everybody... It looked like a go for them. It looked like a big loss for organized labor, and, and a loss not only... It was a big loss to the, to the treasury of, the, of, of organized labor, because they'd have less money coming in. Um, and instead, it's a 4-4 tie, and uh, so those provisions remain in place. Let's talk about the 4-4 ties that may be yet to come. Abortion. Mm -hmm. You see that going 4-4? And tell me about that case. It's out of Texas. It's out of Texas, and a lot of cases this year are out of Texas. This uh, Supreme Court year is uh, sort of all about Texas all the time. Um, but Texas passed an anti-abortion law uh, that had two provisions. One said that anybody who performed abortions in the state of Texas had to have an admitting, privilege, pr admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of the abortion clinic. And the second provision said every clinic essentially had to meet the standards of a small hospital, an ambulatory surgical care clinic. And the practical effect of that would be that you would wind up with this huge state of Texas with maybe 10 abortion clinics. It already has led uh, a whole bunch of abortion clinics in Texas to shut down, and it will lead to further shutdowns if the law uh, goes into effect. So the consequences are very, very serious, and Texas is not alone. Other states have adopted similar laws, so there are consequences not only for Texas but nationwide. Those uh, restrictions on the right to abortion, access to abortion, were upheld by the lower court. So if there's a 4-4 tie in this case, uh, it means that the regulations stay in place, but there is no national precedent, so they can still be challenged in other places but for Texas women, uh, it's a disaster. Um, so it will apply only to Texas? It would apply only to Texas, right? It would apply only to Texas. Uh, and in theory, the other states in the Fifth Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeals that governs Texas but governs a couple of other states as well. Uh, I don't think that there's any way that uh, Texas can get five votes out of the remaining eight to uphold the provisions. I think there is some possibility um, that there could be five votes to reverse the lower court, which would be a victory for women, and at the very least send the case back. Because there are two things about this case that I think may affect uh, Justice Kennedy. Uh, one is there's a very, very broad consensus within the medical community um, that uh, these regulations are medically unnecessary and, if anything, are work to the detriment of women's health rather than promoting women's health. And I think he will care about that. Uh, and the other thing that I think he will care about has less to do with women than with judges, because the lower court said it's not our role to second guess what the legislature has done, even if what they have done is medically unnecessary. And Justice Kennedy never likes to be told that judges don't have a role in deciding these things. So I hold out some optimism that we could win the case, but it could so easily at, at be a 4-4 four, four tie. at Texas, you expect a win? I, I'm hoping for a win. But it doesn't go beyond. No, 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 no. If, 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 the a, if there is a 4-4 four, four tie, it's, we're dealing with Texas only. Uh, if it's if a 5-3 victory, if we get Justice Kennedy's vote here, then we have a rule that the whole country has to follow, not just Texas. So there's, there's a big difference between 4-4 four, four and 5-3. Back to Brennan, getting to 5. Getting to 5. Um, the conflict between Obamacare and some mm -hmm. religious institutions, we thought we'd settled this with Hobby Lobby when it was businesses who mm -hmm. said that their religious beliefs were being trampled mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. couldn't discriminate uh, in terms of what coverage their uh, employees had. Now it's back with a, an actually more religious connected mm -hmm. um, group and what's happened so far and what are we expecting? Well, it's a, it there's been a little bit of a bait and switch by the court here because two years ago in the Hobby Lobby case, which you're referring to, a for-profit business came in and said, we have religious objection to providing our employees health insurance that includes contraceptive care. And the court said to the government, you shouldn't make them do this because you've already provided an exemption for religious nonprofits. They just opt out and the insurance company has to pay for it instead of the employer. Why can't you provide the same uh, exception for the this, this closely held, family held, for-profit business? Uh, and now two years later, what we have is a group of religiously affiliated nonprofits. Saying There's, even opting out. Even opting out. Is e offensive to us. Even, even what you suggested was the answer two years ago is a violation of our religious 
religious rights religious because freedom. you're asking us to set a train in motion that will end up with contraceptive care for our employees, which violates our religious beliefs. I, I think it's a... Um, uh, an unsustainable uh, argument, um, but it's an argument that has more traction than it should uh, in the Supreme Court. And I think that case is is may very well be heading toward a 4-4 tie. Uh, but something very interesting happened. You could tell the court is anxious to avoid that result. And so after the argument in the case, they issued an order uh, to the parties asking them to brief a possible solution to the problem that the court itself developed. Somebody described it, and I think it's not inaccurately, almost as court and Pose mediation between the parties, which unusual. is very unusual. I've never seen anything like it, but they're hoping the parties will come back, I think, and say, both parties will come back and say, this works for us, and then the Supreme Court can... What would that possibly be? Well, I think it's actually a fig leaf, um, to be honest, as, as best as I am able to understand that the way the rules now work, every employer has to provide coverage for their employees it includes contraceptive coverage if you have a religious objection you raise your hand and say I don't want to and then the insurance company takes over what the court has proposed is instead of having the default be a system in which the insurance coverage includes contraception and you opt out at the very beginning you go to your insurance company and say we're buying an insurance plan that doesn't include contraception from day one so it's sort of a different starting point and then the insurance company still takes over right I think it's a in in many ways a cosmetic difference, but but maybe it'll get the court to five votes, and if it gets the court to five votes, they'll they'll have a decision. And will that then be the last of these cases? Uh, I don't think so. I think I think we're going to see uh, legal challenges to Obamacare for the rest of our natural life. There are um, there are going to be bills to overturn it in Congress every year, and there'll probably be lawsuits to battle over particular portions of it um, year after year after year. But uh, this would be a very important victory for women. And on the other hand, if the court ties four to four, there have been a lot of cases challenging this contraceptive of care provision by religiously affiliated nonprofits and overwhelmingly the courts of appeals have said there is no violation this is a permissible uh, regulation by the government except for one court of appeals in the middle of the country so if there is a 4-4 split in this case um, the right of women to uh, get contracere, contraceptive care insurance coverage through their employer will depend upon what state they live in and that's not a uh, situation you want to maintain for the long run so it would be what you would see as a win. It would be a win, uh, and but but it would virtually invite, I think, another case uh, when the court is back up to nine. So let's go on to another issue that I always think is resolved and it never is, and that's affirmative action. Right. What's going on? Also, Texas. Also, Texas, uh, and this is uh, round two uh, for the University of Texas. Um, uh, several years ago, uh, its own particular and unique um, affirmative action uh, plan was challenged in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court then sent it back to the lower courts and said, think again. Uh, and the lower courts thought again and said, this still seems constitutional to us. Uh, and then the Supreme Court has agreed to review it again. This case cannot end in a 4-4 tie because Justice Kagan has recused herself from the case because she Having worked been. on it while she was a gut lawyer for the government. Yep. So there are only seven uh, people who are going to decide this case. So there will be a decision. It will probably be a 4 to three decision, almost certainly Kennedy. Justice Kennedy will be the, the, the pivotal okay, so swing vote again. Okay, so where does he land on this one? Um, where has he landed before? Uh, he does not... Um, there are two things. He does not like uh, affirmative action. Uh, he doesn't like any program that uh, in any way, shape, or form labels individuals on the basis of their race. On the other hand, he's been unwilling to do what many of the other conservatives uh, have been willing to do, and that is to make the, take the final step and say affirmative action is unconstitutional in all circumstances. He looks for narrow ways out of this case. And I can imagine he can narrowly uh, uphold what Texas has done or narrowly strike down what Texas has done. And the real, I think, question about this case is, it, is it going to be so tied to, to um, Texas's really unique system that it just becomes a decision about Texas? Well, we keep reading that it's, it's very narrow right. and therefore not going to create havoc um, in colleges and universities throughout the country. But you say that's not necessarily I so? I think that's not necessarily so. It depends upon how they write the opinion. And uh, and what is what is unique about Texas is Texas has this plan in place that says the top 10% of all high school graduates um, 
have automatic admission to the University of Texas. And then on top of that, uh, it said for a certain percentage of the class, we are going to look at um, uh, their admissions application and consider race as one factor among many in deciding how we want to fill out the remainder of the class in order to ensure the kind of diversity we want at the university. Right? If what the court says is, you didn't need to do the second thing because the first thing gave you enough diversity and that's all you're entitled to. That becomes a Texas-only decision. If the court says, but every state now has to think about race-neutral and has to try race-neutral uh, admissions plans before they go to a race-conscious admissions plan, that would have impact on the entire country. So how does this move us past uh, Michigan back when? Uh, it, it, it would be a step back from Michigan. Right? If, if the court were in fact to say the use of race has to be the last resort, it can never be your first option, even if it is just one factor among many, which is what Michigan upheld many years ago, uh, that would be a serious step backwards. If, if all the court says is, Texas, you tried something else, that was good enough, you didn't need to do this, that would be bad for Texas, but it wouldn't affect many other places. How many years ago was, was that first Michigan case? 10, 12 years ago, something like that. So, um, And that was a 5-4 decision written by Sandra Day O'Connor, who's of course no longer on the court, and Justice Kennedy was in dissent in that case. Well, but I remember Justice O'Connor um, saying that, you know, deal, let's deal with this now, because in 25 years we won't have to. Yeah, well, we should be so lucky. We, we should be so lucky. Would, we would live in a nice world if race disappeared as an issue in American life in the next 25 years, but I'm not holding my breath. So what else is going on? that we should know about. A case that's been decided, say, on juvenile justice, on keeping juveniles in prison for life without parole. The court said, no, you can't do that, but now says you've got to go back and at least consider releasing the people who were tried and sentenced as juveniles. Right. It was an, it was an, important, it was an important decision. A because, big victory? Yes, a big victory, because they said the thousands of kids who were in jail with sentences of life without the possibility of parole, but who were sentenced before the Supreme Court said that sentence was unconstitutional, are entitled to get the benefit of that sentence. Now, it doesn't mean that there's, they get out. It doesn't even mean that their sentence of life without parole is automatically reversed, but it means they are entitled to it an individualized hearing, and it could be. And one would hope, and the Supreme Court has sent a pretty clear signal that it expects in most cases that we're not going to send 17-year-olds to to jail for the rest of their lives and without any possibility of ever getting out. So there are hundreds of people who could be affected by that. Hundreds, yes, absolutely. But let's talk about one that could affect an estimated four million mm -hmm. people in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Undocumented immigrants with uh, American-born citizen right. children. Right. The president, by executive order, tried to give them the right to stay, to work, to drive a car, right. to live a, a life that's not in the shadows. Mm -hmm. What, what happened after that? Texas and 26 states sued and said that the president didn't have authority to issue that executive order because it went beyond uh, anything that Congress had authorized. Uh, and those states sued, led by Texas, sued in Texas uh, and won. And so if they're there again... Nationwide injunction. Nationwide injunction. That program has not gone into effect. Uh, and if the Supreme Court, the case has not yet been argued, it will be argued at the end of April, but if the Supreme Court splits with a 4-4 uh, tie on that case, that program is over, for at least for the remainder of the Obama administration. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think there is a not insignificant chance that the way out of a 4-4 split for the uh, Supreme Court on this one it's going to have nothing to do with the president's authority to issue the order. It's going to have to do with whether or not the states had a right to sue in the first place. And there has been a big fight about that question. Uh, and I think John Roberts, among others, may be troubled by the notion that individual states can come in and sue f over federal policies whenever they don't like what the federal government really? is doing, because that will open the federal courts to a flood of what are really political battles between the states and the federal government. And I'm not sure he's going to like that. So I would not 
not be shocked. But he's not a person who is apolitical. He's, but, but, you know, the thing about inviting lawsuits is you always have to worry about what happens when the politics are reversed, what happens when there's a Republican administration and Democratic um, control of, of, of the states. Does he, does he want those states coming in and challenging Republican policies? I don't think he does. And he also cares. He is Chief Justice of the United States. And, and by virtue of that position, he cares about uh, the court system We've in its entirety. We've seen a couple of votes where yeah. he surprised us. Where he, and, 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 and they're often that have to do with institutional role and the Supreme Court's place in, in sort of our separation of powers and, and you know, tripartite uh, government. And I just don't think, he doesn't want the Supreme Court embroiled in every political controversy. So I wouldn't be shocked if he looks for a way out. That would not surprise me, but we'll have a better sense after the argument. We'll see how much that issue comes up during argument. And what would have to happen in order for Obama to have to move ahead? Do you see any possibility of that other than Roberts making the switch? Uh, no, I think the, well, there, there, look, there is a, a the, there were, the ground, the law with the, excuse me, the executive order was actually struck down in the lower courts on a sort of procedural theory. And the procedural theory was they announced it without giving people a chance to comment on it first, right? Interesting. I don't think that is going to sort of fly in the Supreme Court. I think the more serious question is whether or not he went beyond what Congress had authorized. And there, there's a very strong argument, and actually I believe it's a correct argument, uh, that he didn't. And not only did he not go beyond what Congress had authorized, what he did was not even unusual that Democratic and Republican administrations alike over the past several decades have adopted very similar executive orders def with deferring deportation for groups of people um, who for one reason or another the political system decides deserve to remain in the United States. And so I think if we get to the, if we get past the procedure and we get to the merits of the case, um, there He's not, he will have, Obama will have four votes on his side. The worst he will do, I think, is tie. Um, but there, too, I think there's a chance that, that, that he, could, he could pull out John Roberts at the end, on, even on the merits. Wow. One thing that I've learned in this whole uh, fight between Obama mm -hmm. and the Senate is something that I actually learned from Justice Alito, New Jersey's Justice Alito. Um, he spoke at Georgetown Law School and said, in answer to a question, there's no reason why there have to be nine justices under the Constitution. Right. So tell me, is that so? That is so. He's, he's read his Constitution correctly. The only thing that the Constitution says is there shall be a Supreme Court, and it is Congress that establishes how many justices will sit on the Supreme Court. Uh, the original Supreme Court in the 18th century did not have nine justices. Franklin Roosevelt famously tried to increase the number with his court-packing scheme. Um, but it's not something the court can do. It's not something the president can do. It's something that Congress would have to do by changing the law, and I don't think that's going to happen. So... We've got a law. It's in place. Right. That's not going to change. We now see that there um, are advantages to having an uneven number, right. be it 9, 7, or mm -hmm. what have you. Um, what's going to happen? What is the feeling like? You know, that first day we saw the, the, the black bunting on, right. on Scalia's chair. Uh, now the, the justices have moved around. Mm -hmm. You've been there. You've seen. Right. What, what's the feeling on the court? Is there, I, I'm not saying you miss him, but is it, uh, um, is it different? Well, the court is, I mean, he was a, putting aside his politics, he was a big personality. Um, and he was a big personality in the courtroom. He asked more questions than, than anybody else. He um, told more jokes uh, than, and than anybody else. He, he dominated oral argument in many ways. And, and there, is a, there is a vacuum now, and we'll see who, who fills it. I think various justices are, are now talking up more than they had been when well, he we was still expect, on the court. Right? We don't expect it to be Clarence Thomas, but we have heard from him. We have heard from Clarence once. Uh, we but have, since Scalia's death, we since, have heard from him. We have heard from Clarence Thomas since, since Scalia's death. But, but I think, look, I think that the court is very frustrated. Uh, uh, I don't think the court likes having eight, eight justices. And, and, you know, everybody obviously uh, would like an, an ally in the court. But I think all eight of them are probably united in hoping that this seat gets filled as quickly as it possibly can. And I think if it was up to them, um, uh, the Senate would probably move on this nomination. I just don't think that's in the cards. And Steve, always hard to stop these conversations with you, especially 
this time when you are, I am told, about to retire from the ACLU. I know they will miss you there, and I will miss you here. Well, thank you very much, Sandy. I but maybe you'll it. come back well, without your ACLU <laughs> hat. Uh, stay tuned and join us here next right. week and every week on Due Process for grown-up serious scrutiny of the critical issues of law and justice, like what we've just done with Steve. Till then, for Ray Brown, who had this one off, for producer Tanya Bentley, and all of us here, I'm Sandra King. Thanks for watching. Constitution is pretty clear about what is supposed to happen now. When there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the President of the United States is to nominate someone. The Senate is to consider that nomination and either they disapprove of that nominee or that nominee is elevated to the Supreme Court. The fact that it's that hard that we're even discussing this is, I think, a, a measure of how, unfortunately, uh, the, the venom and rancor in, in Washington has, has prevented us from getting basic work done. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.